We're recording. Welcome, everybody. Good evening. It's Tuesday, February 7th, um, and we are very excited to have uh, Mark Horn here this evening. Uh, Mark, if you wouldn't mind, uh, if you want to introduce yourself and then here in a second, when I start getting my mouse clicking on the right things, I'll share your PowerPoint screen. Sure, yes. Yeah. So uh, my name is Mark Horn. I work for Toyota Material Handling. I'm the manager of the wire harness and telematics electrical systems teams in new product development there. So um, I've got a lot of experience specifically in wire harness design and routing and installation. Um, I've been with FIRST for about 11 years, maybe, from FLL through FTC and then uh, probably the last eight or nine years in FRC. Um, so I've, I've had some experience of wiring up decent uh, operating robots. Um, so I guess uh, feel free to uh, chime in with any questions you have as we go along. Um, so I just wanted to kind of share some of the things, some do's and don'ts and things that I've kind of learned along the way and passed on to my uh, teams in the past. So, okay, so first slide, uh, cable management. So um, one of the um, big things is, uh, you know, as you might be aware, wires are everywhere on a robot and you only have to catch one of them and your robot's gonna stop most likely, or at least something's not gonna work on it. So try and avoid points of interference, pinch points, and anything that's near a moving part you wanna try and avoid. Um, if it's close, then, you know, use some kind of protection. Um, uh i'm skipping ahead now uh i'll, I'll go down the bullet points <laughs> so um as far as uh can routing goes um it's it's a pretty easy to do the can routing on an frc robot uh you daisy chain from one component to the next to the next to the next and then kind of to the end one thing to keep in mind is the termination resistor is uh you have to have a 120 ohm resistor on each end of a can bus for it to work and usually there is one in the Robo Rio and there is another one on the PDP or PDH. And I think one of them you can actually switch on and off. So if you want to have that termination somewhere else, you can do that. So the idea is, is that that is there at like each end of the bus. So kind of when you plan where you're going to put everything, you want to start at the Robo Rio, go around all the components that you need to attach and then finish at the PDP. Um, Next bullet point is kind of going on the avoiding pinch points and things. So use tie wraps uh, to hold your cables and wires um, together. You don't want to have loose wires knocking around. If you need to use protective tubing, there's various um, options out there. Uh, that picture in the middle is like a corrugated tubing. You can, I think, I think that one's split. You can split it and then kind of tie wrap it at both ends to keep it in place or t uh, spiral wraps another option there on the outside. There's a bunch of other things There's like fabric ones you can use and other things if you want to try and save space or um, uh, weight. Some things weigh a little bit more than others. We know that quite often we're concerned about the overall weight. Um, if you've got wires running uh, through any holes or around sharp edges, make sure they're deburred or protected. And then um, uh, one of the things that people maybe don't think about is if, if you've got like your battery cables and then you think, oh, that's a nice kind of line there. I can run a bunch of these other wires down. Um, if it's for like communications, your radio, whatever, you want to try and avoid them going close to those, um, those um, wires just because it can cause electrical interference and cause your radio not to work or, or, or some other thing. So um, crossing them over like a perpendicular it looks um, untidy and not neat, but that's the better way to do it to avoid electrical interference. So when you, uh, are you, is, the British, is the British version of a tie wrap a zip tie? Yes. So tie, well, no. So no. tie wrap is a brand of zip ties. And oh, okay. the reason why I said tie wrap is because there are a lot of cheap zip ties out there. You can get like a thousand for a few dollars or whatever, mm. but I would highly recommend getting decent quality cable ties, zip uh, ties, okay. whatever. The one in the picture there, you probably can't see it, but there's like a little metal insert in the locking area and they tend to stay once you put them on. Um, I was at the robotics team just the other day and we were putting tie wraps on and like three in a row, you pulled it tight and then it just pulled off again. Uh, so you kind of get what you pay for on some of those things. Uh, you don't want something coming loose later. So 
Um, it might be a little bit more expensive, but I'm, I'm a big adv advocate for uh, quality items rather than the cheapest you can find. All Good right. question. So uh, motor connections. So a lot of people will just wire the um, motors directly up to the, um, um, why can't I think of it? Motor controllers. Um, and I, I'm not sure if they actually come with connectors on, but um, these, um, this type, this power pole connector is a really good one that you can get them at powerworks.com. Um, that you can get them in all kinds of different colors. And I know like uh, some of the motors these days and motor controllers have like the three phase. So they have like the white uh, wire as well. You can actually have three that clip together. So all three of them kind of clip together in one bundle and they un unplug as one. Uh, so these are a really nice and relatively inexpensive option and they have a really good positive locking um, um, for them. And they do actually come with that little that little guy you can see at the bottom, that little cylindrical black piece there at the bottom, uh, that actually pushes in when you've clipped the two together, that kind of pushes down between them and stops them coming apart. So that's that's kind of nice, but uh, sometimes it's not necessary. Uh, you do need a specific crimp tool for these. You wanna make sure that you always have the right crimp tool for the right crimps because a bad crimp is gonna cause you issues later. So that's the type of crimp tool there on the right that you would use for these. And they do come in three different uh, contact sizes, 15 amp, 30 amp, and 45 amp for this size uh, connector. Um, and so depending on the size of the wire, essentially, you know, if you've got like 12 gauge wire, then you might, I, I can't remember, I think the 30, 30 amp one is okay for the 12 gauge, um, but don't quote me on that. Um, and these are very similar to the larger ones that you get for the battery, like the the amp. Um, uh, I can't remember what they're called now. The, the the red ones that you get on the battery, they're just a smaller version. Okay, so this is something that Red Alert 1741, my team, hasn't used that much in the past, but we have switched over to this, and uh, I'm getting a lot of positive feedback that we should have done this a long time ago. Um, so these are like these are called end ferrules, and so where you where you're putting a wire into the um, into like a quick disconnect on the PDP, for example, you can just strip the wire and shove the conductors into the terminal, and then let it lock it down. But what this does is this crimps the uh, the metal part there. Uh, the wire goes all the way to the end to that metal part, and then it crimps down the metal part, so it has a much better surface area for the um, quick disconnect um, areas on the um, PDP to connect to. So um, these these are really good. They they avoid conductors getting bent backwards or um, over twisting the wires and potentially having failures later. Um, they're pretty inexpensive. You can get a box of I think that box there is like a hundred of each size or something, and it's like twelve bucks. It's it's not very expensive at all, and the crimp tool is about twenty five dollars as well. I, I will add to that, Mark. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, go um, ahead. Um, I love the ferrules when teams use yep. them, um, especially because if you, I mean, assuming that you do them correctly, they're also wonderful for preventing like the little loose wires instead of just exactly. jamming into the PDP. Um, and you might have one hanging out that can short. The ferrules yep. are just, it's in and I know it's, I know it's closed yep. Yep. and they're wonderful. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. And there's two different types of crimp tool. One crimps like a square crimp and the other one crimps like a hex. Um, we've got the square one. Um, uh, it, obviously, it's going to put it down like on two surfaces, top and bottom, rather than kind of on an edge. So that's why we went for the square one. But I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the hex one either. But just keep an eye out for that. If, you, if you're looking at buying that tool, there are two different tools that you can use that with. Okay, so spade terminals. We typically use these for things like limit switches and, and other things we need to connect. Um, the idea behind that is that if you kind of hardwire it in, then it's hard to replace that. If a limit switch needs to be replaced at some point, it's a lot quicker um, in the pits to replace that out. The colors um, don't relate to, you know, signal and ground or whatever else. They're actually the size of the bucket that, that so they relate to the wire gauge that you're using. Um, so, so, you know, getting a, a good variety of those is always a nice idea. The ones in the middle there are bullet connectors. They work pretty much the same way. 
um, and the ones at the bottom are spade terminals that are insulated. The nice thing about this is you're not going to have any exposed metal that you have to put electrical tape around or anything afterwards. And uh, that crimp tool is a pretty universal one. If it's got those um, red, yellow, and blue dots there on the jaws, you know it's designed for these kind of insulated part of this type of terminal. And you can see underneath there, there's a variety of other ones that it would work with as well. There's the open, open jaw ones and ring terminals. So it's a it's a pretty useful tool to have. Okay, wire strippers. This is one of my pet peeves. <laughs> So people tend to get a pair of wire strippers and use them until they are doing what you can see there in the top right hand corner to all the wires because the wire strippers have gone a little dull. You might be using the same size uh, stripper for everything. So, um, you know, maybe it's only that one that's gone dull. But at that point, it's if you get to that point, you need to replace it. Um, you can see there's a nice clean cut there on the left. And then that's what happens on the right if you either try to strip it on the wrong size or if it's dull um, you tend to oh I, I've seen a lot of students they tend to like grab it like their lives depend on it and their knuckles are going white and everything and they're trying to strip it and the reason it becomes really hard is because they're actually digging into the conductors and they're not just stripping the insulation so it doesn't take a lot of effort to get through the insulation a um, lot of different varieties there um, just just a few um, I, I like the uh, the T strippers, they're the uh, Klein Tools ones. Um, they're twelve, thirteen dollars a pair, and you know when you've worn them out, just get a new pair. The ones in the middle there, they're automatic strippers. They tend to be pretty expensive, but they do last a bit longer. But if you get your hands on a pair of those, those do work quite well. Okay, so next wire marking. So this was something I advocated for several years ago on my team, um, and I think every year it there's always a time in the pit where somebody doesn't know which um, set of terminals that is going to which motor driver or uh, which motor controller or which motor. So um, this, the, this uh, tape that you can use there on the left, you can just kind of ID it like you can see on the images there. So you know that the blue goes all the way through from where it connects to the PDP all the way through to the motor. Um, easy to identify if you've got the wires all cable tied together. I was going to say tie wrapped, but for Chris, I'll say zip tied. Thank uh, you. Together, <laughs> and you can you can pull out the one that you know you need to uh, replace or or check, you know, whatever. And down the bottom there, you can kind of see it's easy to put that around those connectors as well, so you can see where the uh, which one goes to which motor. Um, they're kind of pricey for those tape things. I actually found out recently Andy Mark sell them for about $60, $64 for those 10 colors. But uh, Red Alert has had the same wire um, set, uh, the same uh, tape set for probably about three or four years now. So it's not like it's something you have to um, replace all the time. There's, I think there's maybe 100 feet on each one. It, it, it's not very big. It, it, you might think, oh, that's... Uh, it's probably only about an inch in diameter across the the kind of cylindrical part of that thing so it's they're very they're quite small reels but they last they last quite a long time but again paint pens would be another option um you know as long as you make sure it stays where you put it okay so this is another good one protect key and key components um your main breaker um, has a tendency to um, get tripped off if something hits it, if your perimeter gets breached or if a uh, game element hits it. So, um, you know, everybody's probably got 3D printers these days, so it's pretty easy to make something to help protect those, to protect the terminals, even if you have something going across the top. Um, that's, that's nice. Um, the radio, obviously, the, ro the robot is going to stop if something happens to the radio, so you want to make sure that it's up and away from some of the other components, again, for uh, better communication and less interference with the other components. And make sure that that blue cable, your ethernet cable is, has a little bit of strain relief in it so that it doesn't, um, you know, if it's like a banjo string and something happens, it's gonna get pulled out. Um, I've seen teams that have put like protective, you know, 3D printed things um, around those terminals as well to help prevent those from coming out. So that's another good tip. Okay, battery box, uh, or a battery, should I say. Always check the bolt tightness of the batteries. 
Um, that picture on the right, you know, I, I would imagine most people cover their terminals with electrical tape, so it's kind of a bit of a pain to take it off and check. But if you have a loose terminal, that's going to uh, probably pop your breaker at some point, even if it's just chattering there on the terminal. So um, I would definitely encourage you to have a battery person that checks the batteries before, you know, each match or at the very least, you know, periodically, whatever you decide is the best way to go. But uh, that's that's been cause of failure on more than one occasion that I know of. Um, yeah, and then insulate your terminals. Electrical tape works fine for that. Um, I'm sure there are some kind of um, rubber boots out there, but I think electrical tape probably holds better than, than those, especially when you're moving those cables around at weird angles. And then, you know, make sure the battery is in a safe location. You don't have to um, go crazy and invent the, uh, it, you know, uh, build a, a crazy box like like the one you see there. But, um, you know, you want to have something that comes over the top that protects it. If the robot tips over, you don't want the battery falling out of the falling out of the robot. So, yeah, Kyle, what happens if a battery falls out of a robot and is being dragged around? Um, I think if I actually remember correctly, uh, people are kind of talking about that right now of clarifying if you get disabled and i think you do yeah i thought um, you did um yeah it's kind of dangerous i thought you got it's disabled. not great I, yeah. I if i remember correctly okay. um you get disabled i think pretty immediately um i will add on the the topic of batteries um one uh, frc team 900 the zebra corns a couple of years ago put out a super cool like white paper that the students put together of kind of going through batteries and saying you know, what hardware works the best? How do we ensure, you know, really strong connections that last a long time um, that, you know, allow for the most, you know, get the most bang out of your buck. Um, and it's a super great white paper you can find online and with Chief Delphi and stuff, beautiful. Um, and then for the, especially for the batteries, the Anderson power poles um, where they connect, they do have the, like a hole through them where you can put a zip tie, highly suggest that. Um, yep. It's your battery being in a very firm box is wonderful um, as long as it is still connected to the uh, to the main breaker. <laughs> yeah. And Anderson was what I was trying to think of earlier. So thank you for mentioning that one. It was it, it escaped me for a second. Um, yeah. So that battery box there is one that I think Red Alert put on. Uh, you know, they kind of made that design available at, at some point several years ago and we kind of rebuild or we we build new battery boxes each year. But to that design. Um, I think we had one issue where the battery fell out one time and we said never again. So it's a little bit over-engineered, but it's, uh, it does the job. It makes it easy to take out. You don't have to worry about bungees or, or anything else to unravel. It's just got a kind of an arm on it that lifts up and you could take the battery right out. It's, it's super easy to over-engineer the battery solution, but it's something that you, at the end of the day, if it just works one time as designed, um, like preventing a failure, you've yep. saved hundreds of dollars yep. because when you consider the cost of each match individually throughout a season, it adds up. And like having to sit there, watch your robot just be, you know, dead on the field is a horrible feeling. And yep. these are the things that can keep you playing. Yeah, agreed. And I mean, some of the things that I mentioned are also really good ideas, not just because it's going to make your robot more reliable or better, but it's also just great experience for the students to kind of learn how to do those crimping techniques and, um, you know, kind of understand how to route things and, you know, so get get them involved and kind of make them uh, help them to understand the why, as well as just like you should do it this way, because it's going to make your robot more reliable. You know, it's uh it's a, it's a good mentoring thing there. And I, you know, Kyle, I never really thought about the fact that um, if, you know, early in a match, your robot dies, some kind of battery issue. Uh, I never really thought about the financial impact of that. And that's sometimes something that's good for the kids to understand the whole implication. It's not just, oh, we, we aren't going to be able to help our alliance partner score more points and ranking points and things like that. But we just sat there for two and a half minutes at the price of about three hundred dollars, uh, because and and it could be because we didn't yeah. prepare a safe place for the battery to live. So, 
Yeah, I as a student who has been the result of the robot sitting there for two and a half minutes, I I'm very well aware of the financial impact. Yeah, uh, well, that's good for everybody to think. Well, there's more than one impact. Yeah, so I think this is my last slide apart from the any question slide. So uh, just a couple of other things to think about. Um, always make sure to budget your space um, with the design team. It's so often, you know, it gets forgotten about until you're ready to put everything on there and then there's not enough space. So that's something, you know, the, the people that are involved in the controls team or however your team divides up the the tasks should be involved in the design process. They should know how much space they're going to have, and you know they can work on that. Work on uh, the space that they're allowed. Um, and you know, if you've got any um, bare connections, I, I I think I added this at the end because I didn't have enough room on one of the other slides. But uh, electrical tapes can be our friend. Um, you know, there's various different colors you can get. So you know, if you need to identify something, you can you can do it with that as well. So. I think that's all I have. Uh, any questions? I've, I've found that electrical tape uh, is a lot cheaper than the uh, little roll of um, identifying tape that you had a picture of earlier. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, one, one thing I have found though, if you get that nice little roll of identifying tape and everybody knows we're only using it for this because it's expensive and it kind of, oh, yeah. you control it. And yeah. once you yep. start a roll of electric, electrical tape, it's usually gone pretty quickly. <laughs> Oh it yeah, it, it winds up on everybody's back and around their face. Yeah, you know? yeah. very, very true. Very true. <laughs> I, I also will add one thing that I know some other teams do. Uh, team 1501 Thrust does this, and I always remember talking to them about it when I'm hunting for their electronics before a match. Um, one thing that a lot of teams do, and I think I, if, if you are very sure about it, it's very great. Um, they just hot glue over everything. They're just like, I know all these wires in my Robo Rio are never coming out. So they just whoa, 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 just like cover the thing. And they're like, nothing shavings aren't getting in. And I know that those wires aren't going anywhere. Um, it's it's a it's a lot, but I mean, it's a strategy. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure I would do that just because you don't know when you're going to have to replace something. But um, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's the the trade off as you're doing the wiring and also placing. And I know this is a bit of a different conversation, but when you're placing components, uh, especially like the control components, whether it's a, a compressor for pneumatics or it's your Robo Rio, your radio, those things need to be accessible um, you're, because the longer it takes to get to it, to replace it or, or even replace wiring. Um, it, Kyle, I think, what is the guarantee um, in a dist at the district level? What, what are you guarantee? Is it 10 minutes? I, we, I mean, it's roughly 10 minutes between a match is like your biggest guarantee. So you could have back-to-back -back matches. We try not to do that with the schedule, but it happens. And with smaller events this year, it is going to happen Yeah. Um, at our, I mean, at our district events. Yeah. I think, I think at minimum um, you start getting into back-to-back -back matches about when you start having 24 events, you know, 24 team events. And, you know, mm -hmm. um, especially if you're trying to do, eight or nine qualification matches it's inevitable um i also say like not only is it great for the student the team perspective of something is broken and i know i can replace it because it's right in front of me i just unplug a few wires slot the new one in wires back in and i'm on the road um as one of the field staff i mean my my one of my main concerns you know before a match is you know hey your robot's not connected is your radio on? Is your Robo Rio on? You know, and if I can't find those things easily, it just makes it harder and slower for, you know, to get matches going. Um, and it's just, it's just helpful. You know, if it's right there in front of me, you know, your radio's at the top of your robot. So you're getting great signal, that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, placement really matters for your wires and yeah. for your electronics. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. But then also, um, Mark, to your earlier point too, um, knowing when some wires should be kind of tight to the frame and and um, and zip tied. 
or if they if if you need a little play like on a an ethernet cable going into a radio um you know to give it a little bit of room i mean it there's there's a mix and match there so yeah that's good information so uh, rick the the fta the field technical advisor one of the things that they often will do is you know if if like for your students for example when they get down and set the robot up and they get back to their driver's station if the, for some reason it's not talking to each other they definitely want to before the match starts they want to find the fta and so like at your event for example it'll be kyle and the fta's really one of their main focuses is keeping the event on schedule uh, but because they're technical they can very quickly jump in and, and be able to help you know right yeah. get them talking it, it you know unless it's a deeper bigger problem um but oftentimes the ftas uh can can get them going and uh, yeah and stuff so i mean uh, between between the ftas and the other field staff that we have there you know supporting the whole competition um if something starts going wrong like there's a radio is not working correctly or something we the whole village will come out of how do we fix like and right. And, and then we know. have the spare parts thing <laughs> at pit admin and we have, well, we'll have spare radios. There's usually a couple of spare robo Rios. Um, some of the items in the spare parts tub. And I know, again, we're kind of off topic here, but some of the items in the spare parts tub are items that it's like, Oh, is it pneumaticos? Take it. Don't bring it back. But like a robo Rio, no, we, we take your name. And we will charge you for that. that. <laughs> yeah. At the end of the season, we'll, we'll uh, actually charge you for that. We usually have somebody who's, uh, comes after you so um 